Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Bonsai Stuff podcast. As always, it's me, Scott Martin from Bonsai Matsu, and it's nearly Easter, so we're late March, early April, just at the start of our autumn period, so it's a good time for us. We've got lots of beautiful sunshine, trees are, trees are still pushing out a little bit of growth before they start um, getting ready for the winter dormancy. Yard yeah, stinks of fertiliser because all the trees are heavily fed at the moment, as they should be, and it's a good time. It's nice time to, to get in there and prune a lot of your trees, do um, start doing some shaping and that sort of thing as well. Not uh, not time for pines yet, a little bit early for them, but it's still uh, still a very good time. It's a nice time to be around the yard when you've got beautiful crisp mornings, blue sky, sun's coming up here. You know, the days are getting shorter and shorter, so the sunrise that you normally miss um, because it's either too early for you to get out of bed He's now just at a perfect time. It seems I can get my uh, my morning coffee going and and have a walk around the yard and and really enjoy myself and and soak it all in. So it's not so good for the lawn. That seems to grow, you know, a million miles an hour at the moment. But that's uh, horses for courses. It's it's a it's a great season. So thanks for thanks for tuning in. Uh, it has been a bit of time between podcasts as always. Seems to seems to be that life gets in the way pretty significantly uh, every now and then and. Uh, I've been busy. I've been very bonsai busy. Um, lots of lots of classes now. Where seem to be sort of managing COVID quite well in Australia. So I've also been doing lots of workshops involved with a, a national event too up in Canberra, which I'll talk about a little bit later on as well. And have um, have had a full dance card. To be honest, it's been great. I love it. I like it when it's like this. I think that. You know, idle hands can be uh, be sometimes destructive when you've got only a limited amount of time. When everything you've got in front of you is finite, and you've got a lot of trees there in front of you, you have to be efficient. You have to be quick. I don't, I don't miss doing any of the work that I need to do. I don't miss fertilising. I don't miss any of the the other work that I do with my trees to make them stay in top condition. So I just have to find time for it. So where I um. Where I may have been idle before, now it seems that you know I'm pretty uh, pretty to the boards at the moment, which is, as I said, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. I love it. I think it's great. So today's podcast, um, I wanted to wanted to get one out before Easter. So anyone that's starting to do a bit of a, a road trip or, or something like that, maybe you can can get something to to kill the boredom of travelling. And uh, and here it is. So I wanted to talk today and make the topic of the podcast perspective. Now, doesn't mean... Um, yeah, perspective, there's a lot of different things that go with perspective. When I first started, you know, I was having a surf, and I was out in the water and thinking, you know, I've got so much stuff that I want to talk about. How do I narrow it down? And it's like, okay, well, let's... How do you look at a tree? And I, then I went, okay, well, it's my perspective. So I stand at the front of the tree, and, you know, I look at it. I, I find the front of the tree, what I think is the front of the tree, and... And I start looking. So perspective can be that you, your viewing angle of the tree. And then it sort of opened up Pandora's box for me because I thought the beauty of any piece of artwork is from the perspective of the viewer. So when it's a when it's a, a flattened a flattened painting image or something like that, it's you know it's very common that we all sort of see the same things from when you look at it, not how you interpret it, but when you look at it. But I had a had a workshop the other day, and we were we were designing a, a a little juniper, and and then as we were we were looking at it, I said, you know, I think we're maybe you're seeing things from a, a two dimensional perspective where you're you're focusing on how the tree looks from here. But I said, let's turn it around, let's work looking at the back of the tree. What is the back of the tree? And suddenly, it was like a light switch went on because you know you, where you're placing your branches and 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 how you're how you're positioning the tree, everything, every part of it, the perspective you're looking at that tree from changes. And I think it's really, really super important that, you know, whether you're you're looking from the nabari up the trunk or whether you're looking at the apex of the tree and down, I think that there's, you know, it, it, it's important that when you design your tree with your bonsai, that you have all that in mind, that you, you put a lot of effort into making sure that 
not just your perspective when it's sitting on your bench, but whoever else comes around and sees that bonsai or, or when it gets into a show or what it, whatever it is. It doesn't need to be you know a masterpiece, but I think by viewing it from different perspective and designing it from that perspective to make it as attractive as you possibly can from, from that perspective, it's going to be really beneficial. So it depends on where you're looking at the tree as to your perspective of that tree. All right, so it's really useful when you're, when you're designing, and it's really important to keep in mind to make sure that you're not going to that two-dimensional flattened type design. Because, you know, let's be honest, when you, when you look at um, a, a, a tree on Instagram or, or Facebook, on social media, you'll see it from a, from a flattened image, like a, like a painting when you go to a gallery. It's, it's a very much a flattened sort of image. So you see one side of it, and that's it. If you're lucky, you might see, you know, a, a second side or something like that. But often it's not the case. It's just one flattened image. And my preference is when I when I share, share trees to be enjoyed, I like to show it as a video to show the entire perspective. So, you know, you can stop the video partway through. You can look at it. You can see structuring. You can get a feel that it's not that flattened two-dimensional image. A long time ago when I was... Um, I was learning bonsai a long, long time ago. You know, I was I was encouraged to make things look nice for a photo perspective where, you know, branches, it really didn't matter what the structure of the tree was or, or how it's, um, how, how well it was designed, how rounded it was designed. Like, you know, as, and rounded, I mean, not as in a, a round ball, but as in, you know, when you view it from every side that it looks, it looks right. Like it looks like it's growing naturally. And I was encouraged to, to make it look nice for the photo. And to do that meant compromising where you'd have branches sort of sp- uh, sprayed around the tree so that each one got equal share of the sunlight to being jammed on top of each other so the photo looked nice of the tree. And that really stuck with me. You know, it was nice to, nice to get a nice pretty picture, but, you know, I think, um, I think that to sacrifice the integrity of the overall design just for a flattened a two-dimensional picture at any point in the in the in the bonsai's life is is just a complete waste you're going to pay for it somewhere down the track some sooner or later that design's not going to work and you know we're going to get into more horticultural stuff later on but anyway i um i think fr- from a from a design perspective it's it's really important to to view it from from all sides but then I started digging a bit deeper about perspective and I thought, well, it's not just where you're looking or how you're looking at, at, a, at a bonsai, it's, it's your individual background that changes how you view that bonsai. Right, so if you, you know, um, when, I was in, when I was in Canberra recently, one of the, uh, the, the fellow bonsai professionals who was, who was part of it all with me, Jared Bailey from, from Tassie, Montaigne Bonsai, um, one, he's a, he's a top bloke. And if you ever get the chance to get to Tasmania and see him, then it's it's well worth the trip. But he's he's probably one of the most knowledgeable people uh, that I know uh, when it comes to, to to tree species, and and I think he's uh, he's got a long way to go with uh, with his bonsai journey. But anyway, more about Jared a little bit later on. I've got some exciting exciting news about him. Um, but like his his background when we were talking about some things, it was you know he. He sees a lot of the the wilderness in Tasmania, and he he, he hikes a lot and and gets to remote areas and gets to see, see these magnificent tree species in their completely natural environment. Which, you know, I profess I don't get to do. I live in in the suburbs in in Melbourne, um, and you know, so it's really more of a um, a holiday type trip that I when I get to do that sort of thing and 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 spend time hiking around and, and viewing trees in nature. So a lot of what I see is limited to, you know, an online format or, you know, parks and gardens and, and botanical gardens and that sort of thing. So th- what the vast majority of us would see. So when um, when Jared talks about and, and shares his passion and opens up about, you know, how he views certain trees, his perspective on, on certain trees that become bonsai, it's completely different to, to what... Um, the the experience that i've had so i find that you know um you know his 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 design of his trees is going to be different because he's got a 
a, a process or a thought process in his mind that's very different to what what mine is. Um, and, and another fellow was there, Khan Lin, and he was doing this um, this massive pinging landscape. And I've never actually seen one put together that's this big. It must have been, I don't know, maybe a, a 1.2, maybe 1.5 metres long, this big marble slab, and there's this huge rock in there, and it all got put together. And um, when he... You know, I looked at it and I thought, straight away you look at it, it's appealing. Like, it looks nice. Seeing, I think seeing uh, trees planted in uh, onto, onto a large, beautiful rock looks awesome. And then there's a bit of a landscape thing, which, you know, um, penging's not my, my thing, but I, I can appreciate it, I like it, and I can view it and, and, ex- and, and see where what I think the artist sees when they're, when they're doing it. But then he explained it, and I'd never heard a penging artist explain their design before so his perspective on what he created and why he created it and where the where the memories were coming from that he used to create this this um native native penjing with australian natives it blew me away like i was i was honestly i was floored because the way he was talking about certain mountains and that's what he had in the back of his mind and then there was this this river that he'd seen and these mountains were in the background and it's all all particular to a certain place that he'd been that he loves and and that that was that was his his driver with this design and i i just thought you know again it's the perspective of the person you know the enthusiast or the artist or whatever you'd like to call yourself it's 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 your perspective when you're creating something that really puts the fingerprint onto the design that really no one else can do you know so i've i've heard terms like you know cookie cutter bonsai and that sort of thing and i i just don't I don't think that's true. I don't think they exist. What I think exists is is the perspective people put onto a tree. You know, the no two trees can can physically grow exactly the same way, and um, you know, it's. I think there's you know there's an individual's style that they'll that they'll use like because of their perspective, because of their their background and and what they've got. But I don't think it's that they're copying or duplicating like a photocopier does a style i think it's because it, it's their perspective that's coming to the fore and it's really how it's received by everybody else that looks at those trees and 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 how we interpret or how we how we look at the design that, that bonsai's got our perspective that maybe pushes it into a category saying you know it's a it's another pine tree it's got a, a, a it's first branches on the right hand side they're all the same it's cookie cutter well that's that's absolute crap. There's a lot of skill that goes into designing those trees, and I think it's pretty um, narrow-minded to, to brush possibly a lot of years training, development, styling, nurturing, care, love that goes into these trees just because somewhere along the way you've seen in a magazine a, a, a pine tree. It's like saying, you know, every native that's developed is exactly the same. They all look exactly the same. Well, it's, again, it's just not true. It might be your perspective that they do, but I think if you can look at the design from the perspective of the artist, then you'll see a completely different side to it. There's always, there's always. I'm, I'm not. I'm trying to harp on about this, but there's definitely familiarity with design approaches based on the techniques used and the foundation of someone's learnings. All right, so that doesn't mean that it's highly repetitive, and it means that their approach to design is very consistent. And that's 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 very very different, you know. So, you, I think I think it's really important to to view the bonsai from a different perspective. Otherwise, your view of of, um, of what you like and what you can appreciate it becomes very very narrow. There's different stylings. There's very di- different techniques, and it's not just species dependent. It's also it's the tree style dependent. And you know we've we've got a list of you know six or eight common designs right so that everyone gets to see when they first start bonsai you know cascade semi-cascade formal upright informal whatever i don't think my my approach when i um when i work with a, a piece of stock is not to think in the back of my mind okay which one of these designs is this tree going to become a bonsai to to replicate I never think that. All I think is the tree's got certain qualities and characteristics to me that tend me 
to go down a certain path when I'm designing it. You know, let's you know maybe a, a leading cascading branch. You know, of course, it's if it's if it's beautiful and if it suits the style of the tree, and the tree naturally looks like it wants to be a cascading style tree, then you'll follow that as the design perspective. It's very rare that I'd get a a, a, a whip that's growing vertically and buckle it over and try and force it into something that I don't think it's it's naturally um, pretty disposition is to to be. So, and that's just my perspective. There are people that that do that and I can appreciate what they do and I think it's it's really important that you know when you can if you look at look at the trees from a different perspective whenever possible break down the the hows the whys of the design look at it deeply you know even if you can ask the artist or the owner of the tree of the bonsai why they've done what they've done you know why did they why did they pick that pot or why did they put it on that slab or why was the tree put to that side you know cuz I think you'll find that it, it'll change your way of viewing and appreciating trees when you get that little bit of a perspective on things as to as to what's in the head or the mind of the person who's created it. I think um, I think you, you, one we can all appreciate a beautiful bonsai, but but I think to take it to the next level, which means then allowing you to take your trees to the next level and and, and keep pushing your bonsais to a higher level. I think that 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 differing of perspective is 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 awesome. So there was an event recently held up in uh, in Canberra, Australia, by the National uh, Bonsai and Penjin Collection up at the National Arboretum in Canberra. Uh, Lee Tafe, Sam Thompson, the two fellas that, that put it all together, the brains behind it all, where it drew in um, myself, people from from Sydney, uh, Jared from from Tassie, and we all sort of came together. There was uh, Tracy Francis from Murrumbung. Uh, ceramics the pot maker brilliant pot maker from from melbourne you know we all sort of went to this event together they drew us all together to to show uh showcase natives and also it was an all australian affair you know like covid obviously has shut down the uh the ability for international guest artists to travel but i think um i think we're much better anyway so this uh this event um was held over a couple of days, and one one part of it, when I was um, when I was sort of putting my thoughts together about this this podcast, there's one part of the the, the event that came to mind, and there was a a panel put together for discussion where the five of us five people were put on on stage. So Karen Lynn from from Sydney, Jared Bailey from from Tassie, as I said before, Tracy Melbourne, myself, and Sam and and Lee from the collection, and. When uh, a, a member of the audience or somebody asked a, a question or something like that, you know, you'd, you'd, in my mind, I'd think, okay, well, if that was asked to me, then this would be my answer. This is what I would. This is what I would say. And when I heard the answers from the other people who were attending, it's not that I was gobsmacked or flawed, but I think it was really nice to and 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 fulfilling to hear another perspective on something that was a different perspective from mine now you know everyone's on that was on that stage in one way or another is a you know they're great artists that's what they're there for they're there because they've you know they've they've proven themselves and 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 their their artwork stands up whether it's you know ceramics or whether it's with bonsai or or whatever it is you know landscapes penging i think that you know, so, so respect how you paid, but but hearing the different perspective on the answers made me suddenly open up. I'd sit there and go, "Wow, okay, that's that's not what I I thought." So, so I think I'm learning in myself as well. You know, to talk about this this perspective thing, it's definitely something that I'm gonna I'm gonna run with from now on too, and maybe appreciate things a little bit more and a little bit more in depth than 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 where I was before, and and maybe. Maybe think about what I do a little bit more too. You know, maybe maybe things like pairing pots with with trees and um, how they're displayed and how they're set up. Uh, Sam did a brilliant uh, demo on Kusumono and 
you know, he's, he's talking about that. And I've, you know, naively, I suppose, haven't put as much uh, time and effort and thought into Christopher Nolan. But when, um, when he was talking about it and with, with such passion and putting it together, it's like, wow, you know, it's like, it's like everyone I, that comes to see me for, for bonsai courses or whatever, it's like, geez, I wish I'd started this 10 years ago. Oh, that was me. I was like, oh, I wish I'd started Guzzo Mono 10 years ago. It's, you know, it's now 10 years behind where I should be. But, you know, I think that, I think that as long as you, as long as you never, never think there's nothing to learn or there's nothing to develop or nothing to advance when it comes to, to bonsai and everything related around bonsai, then I think you'll, um, you'll, you'll be in a good place. I think it's when you, when those, those barriers shut and you, you, you're, um, your perspective locks and doesn't change. I think that's when that's when things can get a little bit stale and and possibly uh, and it's, it's not a long term long long term thing. I just think that there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to anything with bonsai. There's just a different perspective, just another perspective, you know. And, it, and people can hold their beliefs and their perspectives very tightly. But it's just a perspective. It's just a belief. That's all it is. You know, I think that there's definitely room for, for cross-sharing of ideas. And these, these, these events like um, what, we've, what we had in Canberra, brilliant. You know, it's, I, I wish that happened every week, you know, where you're bringing people from different climates and different conditions and, and different availability of stocks. And you put them all in a room together and say, you know, what do you think? And I think that it sort of sparks that um, that flame again. Be, you know, you, you, when you when you're in Brisbane, you know, you, you'll see a certain type of stock growing, and you'll speak to people at your local club that come from that sort of area. So it's very insular. And you know, likewise, if you're in Adelaide, in South Australia, you know, you, it's the same thing. You know, there's there's diversity. Of course, there's diversity. I'm not saying it's only you know one type of tree or one type of design or one type of person, but everyone sort of at the local club level is. Is, is experiencing thing at the local club level, whereas when you go to these these national type events or travelling to state for for an event or something like that, when you can, of course, then I think it just changes everything. If you go there with an open mind, with the the view that hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a sponge. I'm gonna take off as I'm taking as much as I possibly can over the next X amount of days, and don't go there with a an agenda to say this is this is what it is and this is the way it has to be. You go there with, you know, with an open mind and say, hey, that's cool. I'm, I'm willing, more than willing to share my ideas, more than willing to talk about what I do and ask people what they do. And, and you know, it broadens your horizons and it doesn't mean you have to necessarily, you know, go back to, to home to your collection and get the chainsaw out and take everything off at the first branch or anything like that. But, you know, and talking with Jared about what happens in Tasmania and with, with his colder climate, doesn't make me wish I lived in the colder climate, but it, it certainly makes me a bit envious of a few of the trees and, and how they grow down there. As I'm sure he would have, you know, being in Canberra and seeing the way the trees grow there, it's like, you know, I'm sure he goes home a little bit envious for things as well. But anyway, that's just um, that's just the, the way it is. I think we um, what we can't get around as bonsai enthusiasts, no matter what, is the horticultural principles of caring for your bonsai no matter what your perspective is, you know, no matter what you want a tree to look to look like, when design and horticulture clash, horticulture always wins, always. So when you're designing trees and you're, you're positioning branches and you're, you know, you're, you're looking at something that's nice for a photo, just be mindful, you know, two branches sitting on top of each other, the one that's shaded, It'll eventually die or it'll weaken, you know. So I think that you've got to, you've got to make sure that you're, you're keeping in mind very, very strongly the horticultural requirements of a tree in a pot, a bonsai, like we, we have and we love, and make sure that you're having that first and foremost in the, the front of your mind whenever you're designing a tree. You can design a tree however you want. It'll look great for, you know, three months, four months, five months. You might get a year out of it, but sooner or later, you've got to pay the piper. You're going to, uh, you're going to find that there's definitely going to be a catch-up 
with, with what you've done with that design. Right, so just an update on uh, on what's happening around my yard at the moment. As I said, we're we're sort of we're getting into the the the, the good part of, of autumn now, where we're going to start seeing some colour change in the next next few weeks, month, something like that. I think the way it's all it's all heading. Got beautiful crisp days. There's still a bit of uh, still a bit of air movement around and northerly winds, which dry out the trees. So. One of the main things that I'm, I'm really mindful of at the moment is, is watering. And it's so easy to look at the, you know, the temperatures outside and, and go, well, it's not, um, it's not enough to, to worry about just at this stage. Or, you know, or it's, it's, you know everything's growing. I'll, I'm going to put lots of, lots of water on there. I think it's got to be managed really, really tightly that, you know, overwatering a tree which has started to go into dormancy, it may start having an issue with the roots and, and root rot starting starting well early on for that tree. The other flip of the coin is that you've got a tree that's still pushing growth and is still sucking up that moisture and and you're, you're holding back the watering from it as well. So you're going to start seeing wilting and damage and potential dieback of, of fine tip branches when it gets out of, out of winter the other side. So watering is... Watering's tricky. Watering is really tough at this time of year, and don't uh, don't don't be using a timer or automated systems because you'll just flood everything unnecessarily. I just don't think that that's um, that's right. And when you when you're walking around watering your trees, just keep an eye on them. You know, just look at you know one will be still taking moist taking water today, but then you know in three or four days time you might find it's starting to slow down again. So it's that changing of the seasons that you've got to be really mindful of, and also you know. Be, start to be careful for um, for the more delicate trees when it starts to get the colder nights. They haven't started yet, but I noticed last night we had a bit of a bit of a cool night where the temperature dropped below sort of nine or ten degrees. So we're heading towards um, towards the frost sort of part of the season soonish, and it's those odd ones that come along in autumn I find that catch me out where you know you get up in the morning and it's 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 frosty and damage is done to the tree. So just just time to be mindful of your of your watering and also the the seasons the other thing i'm doing is is weeding like crazy seems to be that you know it's almost every day i'm out there they're weeding the trees and and taking the rotten bloody things out and then when you finish it just sort of seems to start again so it's just a sign that that we've still got some warmth and there's still you know reasonable daylight hours even though we've gone past the you know the autumn equinox where it's um now more daylight hour, um, a less less daylight hours than, than nighttime hours per day, and it's heading towards you know the winter winter solstice. So um, you're going to have to just be mindful of, of of that with with your weeds and stuff like that too. But because it is a time when the trees start start funneling away the the resources to get through the uh, winter period, the dormancy period. Another thing I've been doing plenty of is fertilising, fertilising like crazy lately. So I've been using the, the tea bag method, which I've talked about plenty of times before. Mix is still exactly the same, 50-50 blood and bone with a with an organic slow-release pellet fertiliser. Uh, lasts, one bag lasts, you know, roughly a month, sometimes more, sometimes less, but let's, let's say it's a month. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, really putting a lot into the, the trees now. I found that the black pines that I decandled uh, in summer, normally I'd be holding back the fertilizer on those, but we had a really unusual summer in Melbourne this year, and I've found that on on some of the trees, the new growth possibly isn't as advanced as what I'd like it to be now, and there's still time for it to grow, so I'm not panicking by any stretch of the imagination. So if your candles, your, your, your new buds that have grown, haven't sort of met expectations yet don't don't panic about it but i have been adding fertilizer tea bags to those those pines where in the past i wouldn't have had to but our summer was a lot cooler and um we didn't seem to get the seem to get the the warmth that i uh, i thought we would have so the other thing with with new growth and and all that is uh pests 
I don't like to um, to spray trees. And I had someone uh, mention to me that you know it's it's irresponsible spraying your bonsais. Um, I, look, I, I do. I have I've selected the the best um, pesticides that I can find in the market that are that are safe for a lot of reasons, and I don't excessively use them. But I will make it really clear that I, um, when it comes to pests and your bonsai, I'll always choose the bonsai first and foremost. Strong, healthy bonsais don't get impacted from from pests like weak ones do. So I'll always push the the health of the tree first and foremost, and then the pests. You know, I can live with I can live with them every now and then. I don't don't have a problem, but I will stop them before they start doing damage to the uh, to the to the core of the tree so so yeah i've been i've been on on guard for for that as well um and preventive sort of fungicide spraying as well because we're sort of getting to that that sort of time of the year as well so and you know i'm I'm getting ready for for repotting you know it seems like i just talked about that the other day but it's you know it's now three or four months away from from getting into repotting full swing so i need to coordinate everything you know, getting my mix ready, getting my pots selected, making sure I've got my supplies, all that stuff, you know. The more I do now at the start of autumn, the less I have to do when I get into repotting later in the end of end of winter. So a little bit of bit of work now, a bit of coordination without stress, without pressure means that I can um, I can definitely make it a, a, a great repotting season again. So what am I working on at the moment? I have in front of me two trees. So I've got um, a beautiful Blue Atlantic Cedar, which I think most most people would know from from Instagram. That's uh, that's getting well and truly due for its its prune and its clean up and its reshape and and make it look all pretty again. It's been left alone basically for twelve months. So it hasn't been hasn't been touched for twelve months and. The growth on it is very refined and very even, so it's not like it's out of control with any of the the spring shoots. And I've, I like to, I like with my my advanced trees. Doesn't matter if they're, they're cedars or or what they are, but I like that. Um, unless it's a, a maple, maples are very different. But we'll talk about that another time. But I do like with my, uh, you know, my 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 conifers or my evergreens to allow them to to push out growth. And stay a little bit shaggy as well. Use the new growth to to be what what dictates the the roots and and how strong they are, rather than just having it you know looking perfect all the time. I really I actually enjoy them when they look that little bit wild, a little bit natural. Um, they get away from that that perfect shape you know that we put onto them, and they just push out a little bit. And that's where this one's at at the moment. Um, it's got the old needles starting to fall off. It's got some shoots that need to be pruned. It did have a few little seed pods on it that um, have, have have caused some dieback on some branches that I need to go through and clean up as well. I don't think there's any wire on it. I'll have to check with that, but that would be a, a great case for, for removing the, the old wire and looking at the branches and seeing where I need to do wiring. That's another thing. When I get a uh, more advanced tree, you know, when you, when you first style it, one, you'll, you'll, you'll shake the trunk with wire. Secondly, you'll get in, you'll wire the, the primary branches. You know, thirdly, you'll get in, it's the, the secondary branches that, that start getting wired. And then as they get more and more mature, there's less and less wire on these trees, unless you want to redesign it. So I find that when you do get to wiring an advanced tree, when I, when I do get this, I often grab three rolls of the lightest copper wire that I've got and I'll put that out on the bench because I know before I even start, you know, I look at the tree and think, yep, branches are where they want where I want it to be, the, the the trunks where I want it to be, everything's looking good. So now it's just a matter of that light refinement. So it's that really easy, simple wiring task that sort of, you know, the odd branch here and there that you put back into place and, and you reset the design and go, right, now off you go again. Have fun. And that's that that I like once you get into that that maintenance mode with trees. It's not always about, you know, pulling out the, the six gauge copper wire that's as thick as your little finger and and smashing trees and bending them and whatever else it's about the refinement and bring it back and you know you you, you can get bored with a, a tree the way it looks you know if that's the case maybe sell it maybe move it on if you don't enjoy it but i really get i enjoy 
some of the advanced trees, more advanced trees, when it gets to that point, and it's it's the more maintenance tasks as well. I had this conversation the other day with somebody uh, where, and I may have even said it before on the podcast, that I think it's worthwhile that everyone that's a bonsai enthusiast, not not a bonsai owner, but a bonsai enthusiast, someone who who loves the trees and you know is becoming addicted to to bonsai, that you sort of you you don't just go out there and buy you know twenty juniper whips and and wire them and shape them with the thought that you know in twenty or thirty years they're going to be brilliant bonsai. I think it's worthwhile to go and buy five of them. But then get some stock that's been grown for 15, 20 years by a nurseryman that has no branching structure whatsoever and it's in a black tub. You know, and you buy that and you, you know that, okay, so I'm, I've got my whips that I'm going to do my base styling on. I've got my, my nursery stock, which I'm going to develop branches on, primary branches, and I'm going to um, start working the roots and potting it up into a, a correct bonsai mix and, and starting to develop the tree. So... The only thing you haven't developed is the Navari in the trunk, basically, because that's what the nurseryman's done for you, which is what you paid for. And the third is to to look at maybe some advanced stock as well, where someone has has done all those things, where they've got the stock, they've put in a bonsai pot, it's been in a bonsai culture for many years, so the tree's well settled, it knows how to be repotted, it knows what it has to do when it's fed, it knows how to handle water, it knows our bonsai mix that we use, and it's got a beautiful trunk, and it's got nice primary branches, secondary branches, and tertiary branches, and all you do is you keep advancing that tree to be an even better bonsai than when you acquire it. I think that if you can get all bases covered, but with those three sort of areas covered, plus everything else in between, of course, and don't overload yourself with you know a million trees in the yard that you just can't keep up with. Make it that it's manageable, whether it's you know five, ten, twenty, fifty, whatever you can manage. Then I think that having trees along all those all those areas. I know when I was starting, I I bought a beautiful mature tree when I knew how to look after them and when I when I learnt the horticultural stuff that I needed to to make sure I didn't kill this thing after spending bloody an arm and a leg on it. But it, it, it changed my whole perspective of how I looked at my collection, you know, and, and also gave me um, guidance and drive and hope with some of the stuff that I'd sitting on the bench that, you know, maybe was still a long way away from being where this one was but I thought you know there's a path and and it's a progression and it's okay well that's that's five years and I'm there so it it sort of it reignites the flame I think uh and and from my perspective I'm not I'm not encouraging to go and blow the mortgage on a on a bonsai but I well and truly forget the cost of a of a beautiful bonsai before I forget the tree you know and you look back on it in 10, 15 years time or whatever and still got it sitting on my bench now and it's still still one of my in what I'd classify one of my, my favorite trees so I think that um, that having that 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 sort of approach is is good and the other um, the other thing I've, I've got going on at the moment is a big Hinoki cypress uh, working on that pruning that back now as well to open it up I'm really mindful with my trees at this stage when I do start working on them one of the primary things I'm looking at is how dense they've got because you know, no sunlight, no air, no life. Basically, that's how it works. So, if you get a nice full branch on your on your on your bonsai, and you know, when you pull it apart, if you start seeing browning of twigs or dead little branches, well, it's time to thin it out. So, that's that's the the real focus I've got is one. Yeah, I want to make it look beautiful because it's only going to be on the bench once for the next twelve months. It's a mature tree as well, but I want to make sure that when I'm pruning it, when I'm finished with it there can be 12 months worth of new growth that will add to the tree and not start killing parts of the tree that I don't want to die. You know, those inner buds, I've talked about it before, inner buds on a bonsai are the one thing that we all need. The, the secret to success with bonsai is, is having inner buds that we can always cut branches back to and shorten our growth because it gets longer and longer every year. We want to push it back and keep the growth nice and compact. The only way we can do that is with, is with inner buds. The only way we keep the inner buds alive is to get sunshine and air movement around them. The only way we can do that is by pruning. So that's that's what I'm working on. So that's that'll be me over the Easter break. I've got these two beautiful trees, lots of time in the sunshine, lots of time with my feet up, lots of time hopefully surfing. So I get to I get to really enjoy things and 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 take it slowly, which is which is perfect for me. 
All right, well, we are there. We are at the end of another podcast episode. So, as always, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm not sure. I'd like to actually look at the stats of people actually maybe start listening and then turn it off before they get to the end because I've just been droning on. But, you know, the the, the feedback that I've received recently has been, been so bloody positive and fantastic so i've got to say i've got to say thank you to everybody and and those that specifically came up and, and spoke to me at this event that i mentioned in canberra bonsai reshaped and and sort of pushed me and said hey when's the next podcast it was that's really cool you know and if you if you can you know i had someone say to me that they'd actually listen to it in in the morning on the way to the event that was <laughs> that made my day so thank you very much um you know, they are still rolling. They're definitely first and foremost to, to keep them keep them coming. As I said, I do get bonsai busy, and it sort of pushes to the to the back. But I'm always thinking about and always thinking about how I can engage and, and keep things interesting with you guys, and keep you um, keep you inspired and, and and motivated with your bonsais. And you know, it's really really some of the the, the big stuff that I like to to do is to you know inspire inform and involve that's that's the three things that i i focus on with my bonsai and and the podcast is definitely a way that i can maybe hear myself talk which isn't the most pleasant thing in the world but i i think that as long as it gives a bit of a spark every now and then to somebody and 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 keeps you keeps you on track you know keeps you that spark in your eye when you walk outside and see your trees well yeah that's that's perfect by me so um, thanks for thanks for sticking around. I do uh, do want to talk to you though. We've got um, a special guest coming up, hopefully in the next 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 podcast, maybe the one after. I've just got to coordinate things. But Jared Bailey from from Tassie, he's uh, he's coming on board. He wants to wants to jump on the podcast and have a chat. So that'll be uh, that'll be great. Would have been great to do it face to face, but I think we have to work out how to do it um, do it remotely from. Tasmania to Victoria so that should be that should be coming out relatively soon so keep up with your trees as I said just keep an eye on the watering make sure you're feeding your trees now you know if you're in the you're in the Melbourne region or you know really anywhere that's that's getting ready for a dormancy period it's really important this this feed to to build the strength of your trees so keep at it keep in touch get me via the socials um you know Facebook Instagram Bonsai Matsu or email me scott at bonsai matsu.com I'm always on the other end of the line to help in any way that I possibly can. So stay well, stay safe, and um, let's get uh, let's get this bonsai train rolling back to normal. Hey, see you later.